Good morning, Audrey. We're so happy that you could come for this interview and we want to learn more about you and all of your activities with the City of Pflugerville and different organizations. State your name. Uh, Audrey T. Deering. And uh, tell us uh, a little bit about what you've done for the city, just basically your role. What would it be? Oh, I, I guess the most, the thing I take the most pride in is the library because uh, we've been involved in that from the very beginning and uh, that has been our prime focus and we've done whatever has needed to be done. <laughs> okay, that's good. We're going to learn a little bit more about you first, so uh, tell me your parents' names and where they were born. My mother's name was uh, Ella Bartles, was her maiden name, Trogget was my maiden name, which is a tongue twister. But uh, she was born in uh, Anhal, Texas, which is at uh, Kamal County. And my dad was uh, Arthur Charles Troggett, and he was born in Anhal, Texas as well. What did your dad do as you were growing up? Uh, initially, we lived on a ranch out in Kamal County, and then we moved into San Antonio, and he started doing carpentry work, and he wound up as the foreman in the Lackland Air Force Base carpenter shop. And what was your mother's typical day like? Hectic. <laughs> she, uh, she was a stay-at-home mom, but she did a lot of things. She always had a vegetable garden. She always kept the yard just, uh, we had gorgeous flowers in our yard. And, and uh, she made, uh, she did some sewing for other people. And of course, she made all of my clothes from the time I can remember. She was an excellent seamstress and a real craftsman as far as crocheting and beautiful handwork. Tell us a little bit about the home that you grow, grew up in, what the house was like. Oh, we were a uh, typical middle uh, class home. We had a, a house, uh, it was uh, on uh, Edison Drive in San Antonio. It was two blocks from the high school and a block from the elementary school, so we had a, our schooling was right there upon us, and uh, it was uh, just a two-bedroom, uh, regular cottage house. Do you have any fond memories of visiting either of your grandparents' homes and uh, what kind of traditions that you may have celebrated? Uh, my. Uh, my only living grandparent uh, was uh, that had a, a residence was in New Braunfels, and she was uh, widowed and had a little cottage house in New Braunfels, which was quite interesting, and she was quite an interesting person. And uh, I didn't spend much time with her. She had reared only boys, and girls were a little bit of a challenge. What uh, did y'all do for entertainment as a child? <laughs> Oh, we um, we pretty much had to find our own game, play toys and do everything. And I was pretty much of a tomboy, so I played football with the boys and basketball and did all those things. That uh, and that was you know there there wasn't a whole lot of entertainment type of things. You played jacks and and stuff like that, which probably. Kids nowadays don't even know what that is. Did you have chores? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, there were animals to feed. We lived in a suburban area, and we had chickens and cows and, and animals like that. So we had those to do, and of course, to dogs and cats and stuff like that. What were some of your favorite meals that you remember as a child? My mother was a, a, a good cook. She, uh, oh, I, I think what I remember most is uh, roast with uh, mashed potatoes and gravy. What was a typical school day like in elementary school? Do you remember first grade or second grade? Oh, I, uh, I walked to school because we were a block from the school, so I cut across the back lot and went to school and. Uh, Went home for lunch. I, I, we, at that time, they didn't have cafeterias. You had uh, uh, brown bagged, or, or you uh, 
and went home for lunch. Most of, a lot of us lived close enough that we went home for lunch. And, what about when you got into high school? Were there any extracurricular activities? Oh yes, uh, I happened to be along to the band all my four years of, all my three years of high school, and uh, part of my junior high school, I was in the band. What did you play? Drums. Okay. Had to be loud and noisy. <laughs> okay. Uh, so after high school, what did you do? I uh, was fortunate enough and I had a, a first year scholarship to go to San Antonio Junior College and so I, I went to junior college and worked uh, part time wherever jobs I could get and, and uh, went uh, to school. What was your uh, first job and what training did you have for that first job? Well, the first job I had while, when this is while I was going to school, I worked at uh, what's now the Gunner Hotel. My brother was uh, in the accounting office there, and so they needed a help at the front desk, and so I, I put up keys. At that time, you didn't have the the uh, keys that you slip in the door. You had a key to each room, and every uh, person that stayed there came up to the counter and requested their keys, and when they let, went out, they put the key on the counter, and you had a big box of uh, uh, files up there, and you just popped the keys into there. And so I did that and uh, answered the telephone. Did you have any siblings? I had, yes, one brother. Okay. Uh, when and how did you meet your future husband? Uh, I had gone to school. Uh, I had finished uh, San Antonio Junior College and had uh, made entrance into Rice for the fall term of 49. And uh, my grandfather, my mother's father, passed away and she was having real difficulty with that and her daughter off in Houston. So I came home and went to work for Western Auto and that's where I met him. He was an uh, appliance supervisor for the San Antonio district. And uh, so when and where did you marry? We were married in the Grace Lutheran Church in San Antonio on August of 1950. In 1950, okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Leonard and uh, his family, his parents. Uh, uh, his, his mother was uh, uh, a Warren, which is uh, well known around the Round Rock area, uh, and uh, she uh, grew up in that area. She was a school teacher at a, and taught uh, school at uh, Jollyville. And his dad was uh, uh, he served in the First World War and was blinded during the process. So he. Uh, had a difficulty with maintaining jobs for a while. He worked for Montgomery Ward and he had lost total sight of one eye and partial sight of the other eye. And so eventually became totally disabled. Um, so uh, Leonard um, entered the military service. Could you tell us at what age he <laughs> did and what uh, what part of the services he served in? Yes, uh, and he uh, joined, uh, he graduated from Austin High School in 1943, and he joined the Navy uh, right after that. He, in fact, is he was not quite old enough. He, he had wanted to join the year before, and his dad said, if you graduate from high school, I'll sign the papers. So he graduated, and he signed the papers, and he went into the Navy. And he served in the Pacific Theater. And what was his uh, duties? Uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was a, a bombardier navigator on uh, what was at that time uh, <clears throat> totally uh, seaworthy uh, aircraft. It was not, uh, it didn't, you couldn't land it on, on the land. It was uh, strictly a, a, a seaplane. And uh, they are now uh, extinct. Uh, you don't, they don't have them anymore, and and he was in. He flew that, and most of their missions were reconnaissance and recovery. His service was uh, after Pearl Harbor had been attacked. Then you said uh, he joined yes. in '43, <coughs> and you weren't married at that no, time. No, uh, when he came back from the service it was in 19. 
oh, about 47 or so, and, and he had gone to work for Western Auto and was transferred to San Antonio, and that's where I met him. Over the decades, he kept in touch with some of his buddies that he had served with in the Navy, and y'all would meet on occasion, so yes. you got to know them. Yes. Can you uh, tell us any stories uh, that they may have shared about the World War II when y'all had the uh, gatherings? No, uh, that was an interesting thing about that group. They never talked much about what they did except among themselves. They, they never shared it much with uh, spouses and others. That it was strictly a, kind of a fraternal brotherhood thing. I think that's a very common thing I've heard from different sources. Mm -hmm. uh, so then uh, you began a family. Tell us about your children and uh, their ages and their careers today. Okay, well, uh, we were living in Corpus. Uh, right after we married, Leonard transferred to Corpus, so we lived in Corpus, and that's where our oldest daughter was born. Uh, Denise, uh, she was born in 1953. I'm going to give her ages away now. <laughs> they may not be happy over that, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> she was uh, born there, and then right after she was born, uh, we tra he transferred. Uh, we lived in uh, a little town on the way to Houston over there for a while, and then moved back to San Antonio, and then we moved up here. And uh, right after 1953, 55, Harry was born, and we lived in Austin uh, on, I uh, uh, can't remember the name of the street now. <laughs> but uh, then when we moved out, then we moved out here to the country, and Linda was born out here in 1960. Well, you uh, had, uh, were raised in another area, lived in different places. How did you determine, how did you and Leonard determine to come to live in Pflugerville, to make Pflugerville your permanent home? Uh, we, at the time that we moved out here, we had the two children, and I called up the, uh, of course, education has always been very important to both of us. And so uh, I called up the Texas Education Agency and asked them uh, what school district in the surrounding area had the best uh, opportunities for children and they said Flickerville was the better school district so that's when we started looking out here and uh, Leonard had uh, veterans land uh, you know the Texas Veterans Land Board had uh, opportunities for veterans to buy land and so we bought under that program so uh, when you moved to Pflugerville, uh, you lived on a farm. Was that your first experience of living on a farm uh, as a married wife? Yes, uh, married. We never. I didn't ever live on a farm growing up. We always had uh, relatives. I had an uncle that had a dairy farm, and my mother put me out there one summer, and I worked on the dairy farm, and uh, that was an experience. And uh, then when we moved out here, well. I got to apply what I learned. So that's uh, uh, at least 50 years ago that you oh, moved yeah. here, and uh, you've had some cattle ever since. Yes, ma'am. So you're a cattle woman. Oh, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, in the after you moved to Pflugerville was when the severe drought hit shortly yes. after that, and uh, you went to work. Could you tell us where you went to work? I went to work for a, a fledgling uh, aerospace company. I called it that, when I went to work for them, they were called Texas Research Associates. And then as time progressed, they kept merging with their other companies, and they shortened the name to Tracor, which uh, then it, uh, I worked for them from 1961 to 1991. Uh, your position at Tracar, of which uh, I think Frank McBee was the uh, president or CEO. Yes. And your position in the company was? Well, I started out in the uh, technical reports office as a, a typist. And then uh, uh, as uh, Mr. McBee uh, advanced, he was a uh, business manager at the time, so he was supervising the, the uh, technical reports office. And so, uh, I was fortunate enough to have a accounting background and and some uh, 
mechanical background, so he needed a secretary, and so I got the fortunate position of going to work for him as business manager, and then as he progressed up through the ranks, uh, he took me with him. Uh, Tracar was one of the um, early Austin high-tech companies, and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, being an, uh, elevated to the national level and some of the uh, general work that, that uh, the company did? Well, uh, Tricor grew from uh, what you might call a, a garage uh, establishment to then uh, we, we were the first uh, uh, Fortune 500 company in Austin and then we were also one of the first to list on the New York Stock Exchange and uh, all of these things happened in a progression and uh, uh, my job, as, it, as the company grew, I, I was uh, allowed to grow with it. I became the corporate secretary, which uh, oversaw the, the issuance of stock and accounting for all the, the stock uh, issuances and, and uh, just keeping track of who else were the shareholders and things like that. It's quite an interesting journey. So you had uh, somewhat of a roller coaster ride uh, in some. You know. Oh yes, it was uh, every morning when the phone rang. Is what's my crisis today? So if you look back at that particular job, could you tell us maybe two or three things that were highlight events that you uh, might want to share? Oh, I think one of the 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 uh, fun things was. Uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to get to go when we listed on the New York Stock Exchange, so I, I got to go see all the bell ringing and the hand waving and all this other stuff that goes on there, and that was quite interesting. Okay, so uh, you found free time and uh, always uh, found ways to get involved. Uh, so. Uh, your children were involved in 4-H, is that correct? And yes. what does 4-H stand for? Uh, heart, head, hands, and health. Oh, health. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you were 48 or two. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so uh, what kind of activities were you involved with at 4-H? Uh, I, uh, um, of course, the children had animals. They uh, had uh, dairy heifers and, and broilers and, and hogs. Uh, we did not, not go uh, into the steers. They were too expensive and too time consuming. But uh, we did do the other activities and then I uh, did some sewing classes and stuff like that. So you were an adult leader uh, teaching other adults and our children uh, activities? Yes. As a leader. Uh, what would you say uh, were some of the benefits of being involved with that program, either as a leader or even with the 4-H uh, members themselves? Oh, I thought, I, I still have uh, run into youngsters that were in my 4-H club, and it's, it's always a fun to see how they have turned out and what they have done with their lives. And I met a lot of very interesting people through that. Occasionally, I uh, still act, uh, I did about two years ago, act as judges on some of the uh, fairs and things like that. One of the things that you did over the years was, in lieu of sending Christmas greetings, you donated to what was referred to as a heifer program. Could you tell us a little bit about that program and how it enhanced uh, people overseas, particularly in Africa? Uh, it was uh, called Heifer International, and it's still around. And, and what it does, it, it provided seed stock for uh, willing people that were wanting to improve their positions. You know, you, you could uh, finance a, a flock of chickens or uh, 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 some ducks, or uh, we uh, make a partial payment on a hog, or you could give them uh, some trees to plant, or. Uh, what you did is you basically donated money and they underwrote these activities for them. And uh, they had beehives and all kinds of activities for these people. But the heifers were, again, uh, an animal that would could reproduce yes. and uh, it, uh, it 
was sustainable. Yes, uh, their main focus was uh, a cat. They uh, did all these other smaller projects that were necessary, but they primarily were interested in sheep and goats and cattle because that was the most lucrative for the recipients. Okay, so let's go back to your children. They were now in school. <laughs> and uh, you knew that reading was a strong component of the development of any child. And you had a vision with some other folks uh, about books and a library. So tell us how that uh, <coughs> seed was planted. Well, uh, like I said, we had a long-term interest in education. And uh, for the first part of the, well, we, when we first moved out here, we had services on a, by a bookmobile from the Travis County Austin Public Library. And then uh, during, during a money crunch, well, they discontinued that, and we no longer had access to books for the children in the area. So that's what uh, started the idea of, well, we, if we can't get them there, let's do our own. So that's what started our idea of getting, wanting to start a library. It takes a tremendous amount of energy and planning and eventually execution to start any organization, to birth something. It's like a labor and delivery. <laughs> uh, so uh, tell us uh, other people that may have been involved with you uh, that, that um, helped start the library. Oh, there, there were so many. Uh, the main core at the beginning of our group was uh, and, and Elisa Condry was the one that really, uh, and Lisa Condry was the person that was uh, the director of the rural, North Rural Center over there for the county. And, and she saw the need among her clients that they needed access to uh, books. And so we were ready for this. And so she uh, put out notice that uh, she would uh, host a meeting of interested people to start a library. And that's when we showed up. And Before that time, they had a, a library mobile that came through, a bookmobile? Yes. Uh, uh, this once was, a week or uh, once every two about weeks? About every two weeks it okay. came through. And it would stop and people could uh, check out books? It, it had a central point of uh, stopping, like at the school up here or, or one of the churches or something. And the kids would have library cards and they'd go up there and were allowed to check out X number of books, and then they had to turn them back in the next time they came. So who were some of the local people who joined at this meeting then with Lisa? Or, uh, came uh, it, it was, uh, oh, Nadine Whiteley was uh, one the one that was there with the first at the first meeting, as well as uh, Winnie Mae Murkison, she was at, with us there. And then uh, those that really uh, can, were really involved were uh, Let's see, uh, Jim and uh, Nancy Pruitt and Muff and Phil Phillips and uh, I have my list here. So they gathered together and uh, uh, from that meeting, uh, y'all came up with a plan? Uh, yes, uh, what, what was that meeting was uh, scheduled for? And uh, there were a number of others that uh, deserve credit for that. Uh, there were the Blake, Blakeleys, that was uh, uh, Bill and Eloise Blakely and Carolyn Olson okay. and uh, uh, Charlotte Elazar and all of those. But what happened was uh, we had a meeting and decided that uh, we needed to establish a, a library. and. Then we started out and created the uh, charter for the library. And, and then, uh, well, we initially started the charter for the Friends of the Library. And then uh, that was done in 1981. And then in 1982, well, we opened the library. What we did is we got, started gathering books and took donations of any books anybody would give us. Okay, and that first library then that you stored the books and eventually displayed the books was located uh, where? It was in that, it's now part of that uh, uh, little uh, restaurant that's behind the uh, old First State Bank building there, okay. is, which is now a tattoo shop. But it's part of that middle section there 
that it was so oh, I guess about 12, 15 feet wide and maybe 45 feet deep or 60 feet deep, however deep the building was. And it was and just... that would be at Railroad and uh, Pecan in that yes, area. Yes. And uh, I think that, that that room had also been used once upon a time for city council meetings perhaps before it became a library. It, it very well probably was. So uh, you had to clean out the room and oh, yes. put in shelves? And, uh, uh, and a little bit about that. All the amenity, all, only amenity that was there was an electric light bulb hanging from the ceiling. There was no air conditioning no heat, no uh, restrooms, nothing else. It was just a room. And uh, we uh, <coughs> uh, gathered up shelves as best we could. And if we recall what was happening along about that time in the uh, early 80s, uh, the area was experiencing uh, uh, a recession. And there were uh, businesses going out of uh, uh, business and so what we would do is we would uh, scrounge around and when there were shelvings behind businesses that we were discarding we would acquire them and use them as shelving for the library until we could do better. So these were volunteers who had to have uh, their eyes open for uh, things and stuff that was out there and be ready to uh, do to manual grab, labor to, to grab bring them. it up exactly. uh, and to establish it and and put in some sweaty hours because there was no air conditioning, no restrooms. No, no. And what kind of rent did you pay? Uh, we initially, at that time, it was still part of the first state bank uh, uh, complex, and <clears throat> they had built their new bank, and they uh, there was. Uh, and John Pfluger uh, at the First State Bank still was president, and he owned uh, and he rented us that space for the first month. It was went fifty dollars, and then he saw what we were doing, and he just let us have it for nothing. So the the first uh, little children that came to check out a book, what was the process of checking out a book? Uh, well, we, it was a while before we had cards or anything. We, it was just sign your name and, and you had to have a parent's permission. So we know where to look for the books if they didn't come back. But that was and all. And it was manual bookkeeping? Just oh, writing. yes. Yeah. Everything was manual. There, was no, there were no computers, no, uh, no, no ma automation. So as this went on, the Friends now was formed and they began looking into the future and you were seeing some success and there was maybe a need for a larger facility. Yes, uh, we uh, pretty quickly outgrew that. What we, uh, we were amazed at how many contributions we were giving and we were fortunate that, you know, when people uh, moved or passed away, they, many times they would just give us all their books. So we gleaned uh, some really nice collections out of that. And then uh, we got so that we needed more space because we were having more uh, patrons. And so the, and we also needed to uh, garner some uh, tax base support so we could be part of the Central Texas Library System. That is a, a state agency that made available to uh, fledgling libraries the ability to buy books at half price. They matched your book price. And so if you had any kind of tax support uh, in your organization, you could qualify for it. Well, we didn't have that when we were doing it all volunteers. So Clarence Bowles was kind enough to uh, give us a, a stipend from the city so that we could qualify for the buying more books which is how we got started in being able to buy better books and more books. So at that time when you got the stipend, you still did not have uh, city employees. It was still no. all volunteers, no, it but was, you uh, had a stipend so that that would justify that, that uh, we could, the grant opportunity. That we could get access to the purchasing power of the state. Okay, and that was huge. Okay, so then uh, let's talk about the second location, uh, which was a larger yes, home. Uh, yes, that was a, a, 
given our uh, made available to us from the, the by the city they had purchased the house on the corner of third and hall street i believe and uh they uh let us have it for a minimal amount and in uh, in uh process we opened our all our uh, collections and availability to our to our resources to the city of citizens of Pflugerville so that whoever could. Let's go back to the first library. What were your hours at that first library? Uh, they were quite limited. I think they were, we weren't open but maybe uh, 10 hours a week, uh, two, two, three hours a day, certain days of the week. And, and then that would fit the volunteers' time, y'all. Yeah, up it's whatever, that you could whatever volunteers we had who could work that time frame was when we were open. When you moved to the second facility, then you did have uh, restrooms and heating and air. Yes, ma'am. We had it was uptown for us. Uh, okay. We uh, uh, they uh, reconditioned the house and and put in air and heating and and. Uh, we uh, did redid the outside of it, and then <clears throat> we uh, did the floors, and and then we installed our shelving. And the way we got our shelving at that point was we sold individual shelves to individual. In, uh, to we would go to residents and say, if you would uh, give us three hundred dollars, we'll be able to buy this shelf, and we'll put your name on it. And we had a lot of support like that. We, well, that's how we furnished our first library. Uh, other ways that you raised money uh, <laughs> from the community? Uh, that, that was quite interesting. Uh, we did uh, bake sales, book sales. We walked door to door and solicited funds. We sold, uh, uh, we had a little uh, novelty called the Pflugerville Flea, which was really made out of a uh, uh, a seed pod of a uh, devil's horn, and it was like so, and it, you, you put little eyes on it, and it looked like a flea. So we sold those for ten dollars, so we got get money for it. And we had gigantic garage sales, and just anything we could get hold of to sell, we sold. You had a chili supper. Chili supper, garage sales, uh, spaghetti suppers. We had and then when we moved up when we had uh, made commitment on the land. We had uh, barbecues and hot air balloon uh, flights and stuff okay, like that. So you continued to raise money and then uh, your friends was still a solid group but you were beginning to look into the future and so what was your vision? We had, we had uh, hoped that we could uh, uh, build a library for the city, or, or not for the city particularly, but for the community. And uh, we uh, found that even though we were raising money and uh, supporting and paying a librarian by this time, we were, uh, we could never qualify for a loan to build a library. So that's when we decided we would have to find a home for it. So your first step, uh, you were able to find uh, real estate property at uh, Fluger and 10th Street. Yes, uh, that became available in, uh, uh, in uh, we bought it in uh, 1988, I think, uh, or 86. I'll have to refer to my note when we bought. We bought in 89. Bought the 89 is when we bought the land that the library is on, that the original <coughs> library was on. And it was 1.6 acres for yes. how much money? I think it was $44,000 at the time. <clears throat> and that was uh, during the time when the uh, real estate business in Travis County was uh, crashing. And uh, a lot of the properties were in a... Uh, uh, trust type of thing with the RTC, which was a Resolution Trust Corporation that took uh, abandoned or foreclosed properties, and we were able to make a deal with them. So you acquired the property, and you needed somebody else to build the building, 
So uh, there must have been negotiations then with the city? At, uh, at not, at, not at that time. Uh, we first thought we could probably try to build it on our own, but then when you are a nonprofit organization with no steady income, nobody's going to loan you money to build a building. And so uh, we uh, decided that, well, we would just then see if the city would uh, take it and our first attempt it was not successful they they were not quite ready to assume that responsibility either so that's when we opened the thrift shop so we could go ahead and pay for their uh, uh, before we had opened the thrift shop before we bought the land so we could at least have some income to pay the librarian where was the thrift shop located? It's in the corner of Pecan Street Plaza there where the gift shop is now, is where it was. Okay. And so that generated additional funds and it slowly moved forward and then uh, let's go into how we, uh, the plans were developed for uh, the third location, which was at this location? Uh, we, uh, we bought the land, the friends bought the land, and, and we continued to operate the library. And then we, in uh, 1992, we gave, uh, gifted the library to the city. Uh, that was the library uh, itself, the, the assets of the library, the books, the the uh, uh, computers by that time we had been uh, fortunate enough for IBM to give us some computers and, and had acquired some assets like that so that uh, that was what we gifted to the city in 1992 and that was the estimated value was about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars at that point and Did it, you have a full-time librarian at that time? No, we, were still we still no. We had a, a we hired our first uh, part-time our librarian at 20 hours a week uh, in 1986. And, but uh, then uh, Joanne Thornton, who is the one that finally wound up with uh, being the librarian, and that was then transferred to the city as the librarian. We hired her in 1987, and from then on, for the all during that time, we were paying all the utilities on the uh, uh, house as well as paying the salary. And the friends did that uh, from the beginning until when we don't uh, gifted it to the city in '92, and that's that was our source of income to support them. So, uh, in designing the first phase of this facility. Uh, who was involved in, in developing that design? That was uh, uh, done primarily by Heidel, uh, and that was the architect of the, did that, and, and then uh, various uh, city uh, uh, employees were involved, as well as some of the friends. One of the amazing features of that building was the window of the world. Uh, the stained glass. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, that vision and who did it? That was uh, uh, after this building was built. Uh, we wanted uh, the friends wanted to give some kind of a, a thank you or acknowledgement to all the people that had worked and put in all those volunteer hours, as well as to thank the city for taking over our dream and making it come true. So uh, we had had a, a soft sculpture, which was a, a uh, like a quilted pattern of children sitting around a table holding hands and reading books. And so we decided that that was a, a, a good theme to carry through. And that's what we decided then when we had this, saw this window out here, that that was a good place to, to expand on that. And if you look at the window, it looks like it has uh, various open books as the frame around it. And then there you see the children of all uh, ethnic backgrounds holding hands and, and enjoying the vision of this education. And part of our whole theme, what it always been, was that uh, education and reading was not for just uh, a certain people, it was for everybody. And we really felt strongly 
about the, uh, that the, it should be available to all ethnic groups. We had local artisans to design and to construct. Could you talk about yes. uh, the, the, the person who designed the window and then the one who built it? Jan Spears is uh, the lady that was the designer, the graphic designer that drew all the, the she was a, an amazing uh, artist and she drew every, uh, every one of those four by four foot windows and, and scaled it so that all of them would be in scale to each other as well as she uh, uh, created the uh, different colors of glass needed. Uh, she was very amazing and then of course uh, Pastor Ray Kramer is the one who was the artisan and he he was a, he's a real craftsman at doing uh, glass windows and he did uh, did the artisan work, did all of it. Tell us about the uh, dedication event uh, for that building. I know that uh, First Lady of Texas, Laura Bush, was uh, a featured guest, uh, and uh, it was um, an event to celebrate. Yes, uh, we we uh, we had. Uh, let's see, we did. We had Laura, Laura Bush. Uh, I think Joanne was the one was able to get her, and we dedicated that in 1999. Uh, and she came out, and of course, her uh, history or background was as a librarian as well, so she was quite interested in coming and being part of it. Uh, I think another uh, fundraising effort was you had, did you sell bricks uh, for this? No, we, we uh, looked at that. There was a name? Yeah, we had uh, uh, names on, on the plaque. And, of and donors. Of donors, and, and um, uh, those uh, we will probably be hanging them again into our in our office in the new library. So then again, uh, we found the use of the library was profound and it needed to grow again. So the seed that was planted uh, continued to be fruitful. And, Indeed. Uh, so let's talk about uh, how the next phase, the present phase, was. Uh, was built and your involvement in that? Uh, that by that time it was part of the city and, and uh, we were not very uh, involved in the planning of it. Uh, we were gra grateful to see it grow and the city had purchased the additional land uh, for it and uh, uh, then uh, we uh, and they have uh, given us a, a office this is the first time we've had a home that we could call her on always it was either my dining room table or somebody else's dining room table for our office so now we have an office in the new library and and uh, and we're just are very gratified to see that how it has grown um, one of the features of the new facility is the fountain and outdoor area could you expand on yeah. Uh, the, that was a joint uh, effort between the city and the friends and, and uh, the library and we uh, made an application to the LCRA and they funded it and, and uh, then uh, and helped us get it uh, the fountain. Uh, fountain and, and uh, get it uh, installed and all. Uh, and are the friends remain active today? Yes, uh, our role has dismini diminished a whole lot. We, uh, thank goodness the city has been generous in funding the library book purchases, so we no longer have to be responsible for all that. And, and so our main contribution now is probably in volunteer hours as well as uh, special funding like we fund uh, in the past, we have always funded the summer reading program for the children, and then this during this past year, we have assisted in the purchase of uh, uh, scanning uh, uh, equipment for the archive project, and also a, a 3D scanner for the 
3D printer, which is quite interesting. It's a, quite a new technology that they have taken. Anytime I visit the library, the adult area is filled to capacity around the computers, and I know that uh, the seed that you planted may have initially been for children's books, but it quickly expanded to adult education. Tell me a little bit about your vision for adult education over the years and how it's uh, come to fruition. Well, we even in, in our second location had a, a, a little back room that we called the computer room, but it was really storage. And we were fortunate enough that uh, uh, Howard B.R., who was working for IBM at the time, put in for a grant for a computer. And so we got, were able to get our first computer from IBM from, uh, for, uh, so then we started holding classes. And uh, Jim Pruitt and Phil Phillips were uh, computer engineers, and so they conducted the classes. And so that's where we first got our teeth into the computer world. And then as, as we grew, well, uh, we acquired additional computers. I think we had a couple of more donations. And, and so we started uh, teaching uh, computer classes. And, you know, it, it, everybody knows what has happened to computers. <laughs> it's just taken on its own life. Okay, uh, we're going to go to uh, some of your other <coughs> involvements. Uh, you were a charter member of the Pflugerville Education Foundation. Uh, can you tell us about that organization and the role that you played? Uh, I was fortunate enough to be asked to be a charter member, and the role of that uh, group is to fund additional uh, projects that teachers can have under grants that the school district is, they're usually pretty uh, uh, forward thinking, so they're not proven uh, experiences so that the t school could fund them. Uh, and so what the foundation does is it funds these projects and then if they're worthy, they usually grow into incorporation into the curriculum. It's, it's nearly an incubator of new ideas. It, that's, that's basically what it is, yes. So again, you were back into the fundraising and it was beyond bake sales and uh, chili suppers. Uh, what are some of the events the Pflugerville Education Foundation does to uh, uh, raise funds? They, uh, there, there are two main sources of, of funding uh, are the uh, golf tournament and then the annual uh, star evening of the stars, which at those uh, gala events, they usually honor past graduates of the Pflugerville School District that have uh, achieved notoriety, I guess you'd say in various f fields. And then you have the uh, Schoolhouse Scramble golf. Yeah, that's, golf. A, that's the golf tournament, Schoolhouse Scramble. And anybody can donate at any time. Oh yes, we, we were not particular as to whose money we take or how much. Uh, you've had many leadership roles. Another was uh, you were on the church council at Emanuel Lutheran Church. Uh, are there any comments uh, in that arena? That no, I enjoyed my experience there. Uh, uh, that's been a, quite a while back, and it's uh, it, it's a whole different uh, environment now. Okay. Uh, your late husband Leonard was a community leader and volunteer. Uh, he involved a lot of community people with his famous barbecues. <laughs> so. Uh, you want to tell us about some of those barbecues? He, he, he was uh, he and he, he he was referred to as Leonard Deering and his barbecue buddies, <laughs> and and uh, there was a whole group of uh, gentlemen that and enjoyed this, and they were always uh, doing weddings and and uh, birthdays and anniversaries, and probably one of their biggest projects was the annual Pflugerville uh, barbecue we used to have down in the. Uh, is back behind Gatlinburg now. There's a big meadow back there that belonged to uh, T-Boy Timmerman, and they would have an annual barbecue back there. And they, would, the whole community was invited. It was just a open 
to everybody and they did this for a number of years and finally then just quit doing it. And not a bite was eaten until everybody sang God Bless America. Exactly. Uh, Leonard went on to serve on the Manville Water Supply Corporation Board. Uh, could you tell us uh, any experiences that uh, about that? Yes, uh, when, uh, uh, when he went on it, uh, they uh, were uh, a real, uh, they were just beginning really, they had been in business for a while, but uh, they uh, uh, had uh, not organized as well as they might have, and so uh, they were in uh, quite a quite a debt, a bit of debt, and so he was able to uh, reorganize and direct their money or their expenditures or their financial, and pulled them out of the uh, red, so to speak, and made it a uh, ongoing profitable. And that was a. Uh a life-saving organization for many people because of the severe drought when they did not have water to drink. Exactly. In the 57 and 58 in this community and it was through the development of Manville Corporation that people did then have water to drink and to bathe and to cook with. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, Leonard also served on the uh, Flickerville Independent School District Board of Trustees and as an officer. Uh, how many years did he serve and do you remember any uh, issues at the time? <laughs> well, I do remember that uh, at the time that uh, he was on it and I don't remember the dates exactly, uh, but I know that uh, they were not, uh, did not have a centralized purchasing at the time, he, all the individuals, there were just three schools in the district uh, when we moved out here, and of course that had expanded at that point, and there were quite a few more. But as they grew, each school was autonomous. Each did their own purchasing and all like that, and he was instrumental in getting the purchasing consolidated. And I remember uh, Sharon Bowles saying that uh, she would, he would come up there uh, every month when the bills were due and sign every check himself to see exactly where that money went. One of the things that I remember is that, uh, again, with children, there were no baseball fields for Little League Baseball. Um, they started one behind the fire hall, uh, where Flitter Hall presently is, and because of the growth in the community, there was a need to expand. And Leonard was president of the school board when a group of citizens came and asked about uh, using the additional land by Pflugerville Elementary School to turn it into uh, playing fields. And I think it now has uh, five or six playing fields on yeah. it. Um, so that was another contribution. Yeah. He was president and he met with the community and they worked out a, a, a contract that would Sir. make that work. Yes. And also uh, he was uh, on the board at the time that uh, Pflugerville High School was built. He was uh, he was on the board. When it moved from the Pecan location at Timmerman Elementary to, in Penn Street yes, to uh, the new location. The 1300 block. Yeah. Um, well I think that uh, considering both of your service, Leonard and Audrey Daring, that uh, it was uh, appropriate that high school, I'm sorry, elementary school uh, was named in your honor. Uh, so you have visited this present new school and you want to tell us a little bit about that school? Well, I, first of all, uh, our family is indeed very honored to be uh, have this school named after us. And, and we are so impressed with uh, the uh, planning that went into the school and, and uh, all the uh, newest uh, technologies that have been incorporated into it to the benefit of the children. And, and it is just a, a, a very uh, outstanding school. And of course, I would think so regardless, but it is in its own right. Um. 
your joint business ventures, you and Leonard, uh, you uh, took the opportunity to become a uh, city of Pflugerville business owner on Pecan Street. So uh, t tell us about acquiring that property and then the development of that. Uh, this is the, the uh, 400 block of uh, West Pecan Street where it's, uh, Pecan Street Plaza is now located. And uh, uh, Leonard was friends with uh, the uh, Fluger that was an architect, and I don't remember his name. Jim Fluger. Yes. Uh, and uh, he had told him uh, when uh, they were deciding what to do with that piece of property, because that piece of property was owned by Mrs. E.J. at the time, and, and I think that was his mother. and. Uh, she was uh, quite up in years, and, and she was living there at first, and then they had to take her and take her and live her with them or something. And uh, so Leonard had told him if they were ever interested in selling it, that you know, to let him know that we might be interested. And so that's how we got involved in it, and that's how we bought it. Okay, and it was E.J. Fluger, his son, that you probably worked yeah. with. And uh, Mrs. E.J. was actually the uh, daughter of, uh, I'm sorry, granddaughter of the first Fluger that immigrated in uh, 1849. Conrad was, was her grandfather. Oh, well, you know better about that than I do, because that's... Okay, and so then you added on and uh, have how many businesses are actually in... in there the are nine uh, locations in there, nine units in there, and, and we kept the original house uh, as uh, as it was because it, it, it just appealed to us, and it was a, a, a good... Uh, uh, anchor for the rest of the shopping center. It's interesting uh, that the lots from early Pflugerville were nearly a full block. In other words, uh, you have uh, frontage from 4th to 5th Street. 4th to 5th Street and exactly. it was uh, totally all of her property. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, nearly the whole half the block. Half the block. Yeah, and and uh, uh, when when we bought it, uh, of course, uh, it had uh, it was the only thing on it was the house, and but she had some beautiful gardens out there, and there was one uh, she had. Uh, she's quite a. You probably know her more about her than I, but uh, she was quite a horticulturist. She she uh, had a somehow made a greenhouse out of rocks that she had embedded in the ground and, and had uh, fashioned a, a place where she kept her plants. And that was quite interesting when we discovered all that. I'd like to focus now on what the city of Pflugerville was like when uh, you first came to Pflugerville. Your first impression when you in 1953 came to Pflugerville and came through the little town. What did it look like to you? We, we moved out here in, in 1959, and uh, uh, it was a dirt road from, uh, well, it was a blacktop, kind of a well, half blacktop as they used at that time, and uh, 35 wasn't there yet. You came out Burnett Road and turned off on now 1825 and came around, and uh, got to Pflugerville, and then from Pflugerville out to where I live, it was like just dirt roads. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there were less than 500 people here at the time when we showed up. Uh, so when you bought the property in Pflugerville, the city was incorporated. You remember what year you actually bought the, the property? It was after 65. Yes, it, it was, uh, we, we built a, shopping center in 84, so we uh, we bought it, I guess, about 82 or something like that. So where did you have to go for building permits or for city offices at that time? We uh, we had to go to Clarence Bowles. I mean, he was the city manager and he was managed everything. You know, you had to okay, go so to So there him. weren't that many employees? No, no. Uh -uh. Okay. And I don't remember where, the, where they were housed at the time. Uh, that, that was kind of a period when they were here and there. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, and what were the streets like on the side streets? Were they? They were. Uh, uh, they they were uh, semi uh, hard top, but but they weren't paved like they are now. Okay. All right. Um, do you remember any? Uh, Encounters with the city council at their meetings. How long were their meetings? Are are issues that that were in Pflugerville at the time? Maybe not necessarily personal, but what what were some of the issues that the city faced at that period of time? Well, uh, there was uh, uh, traffic was increasing, and and the roads were a problem, and uh, and typical uh, problems of a growth situation in the city where, uh, you know, they, they decided we needed a light, you know, a traffic light, and that became an issue, and, and uh, just the things that uh, nowadays are considered just ho-hum uh, for issues. The street, uh, Pecan Street, was originally a two-lane street. Yes. And so they took some of your property when they widened it. No, uh, what uh, we what we we uh, Leonard and I were appointed on that uh, committee to talk to the state about you know when they brought uh, Pecan here 1825 uh, up to the school here and it was a uh, three lane. Uh, they wanted the city to go ahead and let them come through as a three lane or even possibly four lane. So they put us on the committee to see about it and, and we had, uh, uh, finally Leonard had talked to someone in the, uh, the highway department because it is a state highway and uh, they, uh, there was, they figured out there was enough uh, right away uh, that they could put the three lane and put a two lane and a turn lane in the middle but it would have involved the city moving uh, a power line and they were did not want to spend the $60,000 to, to, to move the power line so it could be put in a three lane road. So. Okay, so uh, you have seen a lot in your 50 years here in Pflugerville. Uh, you, can you tell us about, now we have a uh, Austin Executive Airport but it's located in our community. In fact, it's, uh, you could throw a stone from your house to, to the terminal. Right. Or the uh, uh, landing. Yes, uh, the, the uh, uh, landing strips butt up to the back part of my fence uh, there, and, uh, it, it's, uh, and the road to the airport is what used to be the lane to my house, mm -hmm. and so now it's the road to the airport, and and uh, it's been quite that's been quite an interesting trip. Um, it's a very active airport. Yes, uh, and, and 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 I think it has a great potential to be a whole lot more than what it is at present because uh, I, as I speak with some of the people over there. Uh, they are about to reach the threshold of, uh, that will allow them to extend the, the uh, landing strips another thousand feet, uh, which will become financed by some federal funding. And once that happens, of course, then there will be much larger aircraft. One of the busiest times of the year there is during the uh, F1 Circuit of America's race. And, right. uh, uh, you see a lot of action. Oh yes, uh, they uh, first year they had it that they uh, helicoptered or shuttled from uh, Austin Executive Airport to uh, uh, the F1 or the what is it, the Plaza of the Americas over there, or certain what is the name of that uh, is the F1 what facility. The future growth and the present growth is along SH-130, which is very close to where you live. And on the other side, on the west side, is where the uh, there's development going in with Impact News is already there. And uh, I think the uh, hotel is best coming. Western. So uh, 
what is your uh, what is your vision as to what this whole area will be in five, ten, twenty years? It will probably be uh, mostly commercial uh, because I think that that's what's developing out there, and uh, with the uh, proximity of the. Uh, 130, and uh, now the LCRA, LCRA has put a big relay station in down there, uh, not far from our property. And I think that that will uh, probably facilitate more commercial development. Uh, <coughs> one of the things in Texas is we know that there are snakes. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your uh, personal experiences with snakes over the last 50 years. They haven't changed. Uh, we really had no uh, problem with uh, snakes the early part of our tenure out here. Uh, we'd, all we had were those uh, old blue racer rat snakes and, and chicken snakes. But here of late now we have uh, acquired uh, a residency of a lot of rattlesnakes. And uh, we have uh, we have quite a few of them, and uh, I guess my most recent encounter was the uh, one I had on my back patio, and I thought I was going to be Annie Oakley, and I went out there and I shot it, and, and uh, I, I did kill the snake, but the bullet ricocheted and shot a leg and off my chair, and the, one of my patio chairs, so and that's my encounter with the snakes. As an octogenarian, you remain very tech savvy and active. What is your secret to success, good health, and making things happen? Good genes. <laughs> That's about the best I can say. It's very good. Uh, anything else that you would like to tell us? I know you've pondered uh, numerous things, so are there any other ideas? Uh, comments that you would like to make? No, I, it's, it's been an a interesting journey in, uh, in so many different directions, and I'm just uh, grateful I had the opportunity to play. Um, being a very visionary person and a doer, is there any advice you would like to uh, uh, share with new citizens or current citizens on how they could be involved? Uh, are. I think it's just a, a mindset that they have to have to want to uh, be helpful. Uh, there are so many opportunities out there. You can pick and choose what appeals to you. You don't have to go any particular road. There are so many different avenues that if you want to be involved in the community, they're all available. Uh, I want to go back to one thing. Um, the early business owners that you may have known in Pflugerville, do you uh, recall any uh, key characters or individuals that you uh, thought were uh, important to the town or just uh, some of the business owners? I think, uh, no, I really can't uh, think most of the people that were there uh, were involved in business at the time that we started out were uh, long-time residents uh, like uh, Willard Pfluger uh, had the Texaco uh, and, and uh, Mr. Meiske had the service station there and, and uh, Mr. Becker and Ms. Becker had the little uh, ice house station there and, and uh, those types of people. They were all here long before we were and were very nice to be associated with. Well, thank you so much for your service and uh, your contributions to make our city a better place for all the citizens. It's been and my it pleasure. And it will be sustainable into the future because the library is, a, uh, is such a key. Well, it's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. What movies did you go to? What songs did you... In 1965, I had just gone back to work. I went to work for Tracor in 1961. And in 1965, it was just day-to-day, uh, -day, just uh, going to work. I, there wasn't a whole lot of free time to do much of anything. 
what were uh, news topics at that time? Uh, duh. <laughs> yeah, do, do you remember anything about the city being incorporated? Very know? vaguely, because I was not involved. I was out, way out in the country at that point, and, and uh, we had no interests in town yet at that time. We had not bought any real estate or anything. Mm 